I'm an occupational therapist. I work in private practice and sensory processing is one of my passions. Last year, I attended the um, International Sensory Integration Conference in America. And we are, well, it is definitely coming to Australia next year um, towards the end of the year. So I'm really excited about that as well. Um, I'm going to talk about sensory processing, which is something that all our individuals with Fragile X experience. It is something that if they are processing the sensory information well, they are absolutely delightful. But when the sensory processing is not good and they are feeling overwhelmed, we see behavior challenges and things that just make it difficult um, for parents, caregivers, teachers and therapists to work with them. And we see some unpleasant behaviors emerging. So what actually is the sensory processing? We are all taking in sensory information constantly. So while you're sitting listening to me, you are taking in information from your environment, as well as your body providing some information as well. So sensory processing is the neurological process that helps us to organize all this environment from our body, sorry, all this information from our body and the environment and to actually work out what do we do with this information. We have to interpret it and then we have to respond to the information and adapt to that information if required. So while you're sitting at home now, if you're feeling cold, you will sense that you're feeling cold and your response will be to turn on the heating, get a jumper, put on warmer shoes or something like that. If your sensory processing is not working effectively, you may not feel that you're cold, despite the fact that there's no heating on in your house and it's 10 degrees inside. And then you may just be walking around in a t-shirt and shorts, which to a person whose sensory processing is intact seems a little unusual. We take in information from our senses and they're the five senses that everybody knows about. So sight, what we see, hearing, obviously what we hear, taste, um, touch, then we have um, smell as well. And those are the sort of five senses everybody is familiar with. There are another three senses, which I call the hidden senses. And they're at the bottom. The first one is proprioception. And proprioception is awareness of where your body is in space. So the fact that I am now sitting on a chair, but I'm sitting upright, my body is telling me where I am. It's telling me that my feet are flat on the floor. And it's telling me that I'm looking at the screen right now. The vestibular system tells us a sense of movement. So children or individuals who get car sick very easily often have overactive vestibular systems because their body thinks that it's moving way more than it actually is. And this makes them feel unwell. And it also helps us grade our movements. So for instance, if we're throwing a ball, the vestibular system tells us how fast we need to throw the ball and how hard we need to throw the ball to reach our destination. The last um, internal system we have is the interoception. And this is the last of the eight senses to really develop well. And the interoception is responsible for things such as feeling pain, temperature, um, knowing that you need the toilet, knowing that you're hungry. It's actually knowing what your body is doing inside. Now, the sensory processing system takes all this information, it organizes the information, and it uses past experiences that we have as well to then help us to interact with the environment. So if your individual with Fragile X has had negative experiences before from a particular stimulus, like say they hate the noise of a vacuum cleaner, and they suddenly hear that noise of a vacuum cleaner, when they're organizing this information in their brain, they start to feel overwhelmed by it. And then their response might be to scream, to withdraw, to run away, to lash out. So there are different behavioral responses to the sensory information coming into the body. Now, sensory overload is something that I'm sure most families, caregivers, therapists, and people associated with individuals with Fragile X have heard about. Um, sensory overload means there is too much sensory information coming in at one time. So what may be overwhelming to one individual may not be overwhelming to another. But generally, individuals with Fragile X are far more sensitive 
to things like touch. So they may perceive that people are hurting them or bumping them when people are literally walking past and brushing against them. They may perceive that sounds are too loud. So just like things like hair dryers, vacuum cleaners, school bells, intercoms, and other sounds, they may think that certain lights are too bright, whereas to you or me, they may seem perfectly tolerable. And they may also have very strong senses of smell. I'm just thinking back to a young boy who came for therapy one day. We had painted our therapy rooms on the weekend. He came on a Thursday afternoon for his session. He walked into the building. He said, the smell. I said, what smell? Because by now I had forgotten about the smell four days later. And he said, I smell paint. And he ran out the therapy, out of our building, in fact. And he actually couldn't come to therapy that day because the smell of that paint was so overwhelming to him, but I hadn't even noticed it. Um, so we sent him home. So the other thing that you have to bear in mind is that everybody senses sensory information differently. We all have different sensory preferences and that individuals with fragile X tend to be more sensitive to a lot of the different stimuli. The thing that often happens with fragile X is they go into a state of hyperarousal. And this is because they cannot actually cope with the different stimuli that they are facing. And hyperarousal, as many of you will know, is not a pleasant thing. And it often leads to different behavioral responses. So the way that we know that they've got difficulties with certain sensory inputs is the behavior changes. And we have to sort of become detectives to work out what is making that behavior change? What stimuli are causing them to become uncomfortable, dysregulated, and hyperaroused? I'm going to just talk a little bit more about hyperarousal because it is such a prevalent characteristic of the fragile X phenotype. Um, and it is an excessive response to sensory stimuli. And the responses are actually physiological responses. It's the way our body responds, and we have things such as increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, more rapid breathing, sweaty palms, dilated pupils, and reddening of the face and ears. Now, as we know, individuals with fragile X sometimes tend to have larger ears, and I actually had a mum say to me last week, I didn't realize until recently that every time his ears go red, I can expect an explosion in his behavior after that. So what she was actually seeing was that physiological response. He was becoming hyper aroused. He wasn't saying anything. And then there would suddenly be this explosion. So when people say their behavior went from zero to 100 in a matter of seconds, it wasn't a matter of seconds. There were so many things that were happening for him in the lead up to that explosion. But now mums become aware of that reddening of the ears and she knows that she needs to do something and act fast to prevent that explosion now. The question I've often been asked is, do sensory challenges go away? And the thing is, sensory challenges don't go away, but as people get older, they often learn to cope better with the sensory challenges. As the nervous system um, matures, they often reduce. And there are many, um, I would say parents and caregivers of people with fragile X individuals who come in and they go, oh, I think I also have certain sensory challenges. I remember that being a problem, but now I've learned to deal with it. So I think we often learn different coping strategies to deal with these sensory challenges. And if they are not treated, there is no evidence to show that children will outgrow these sensory challenges. They simply learn to either adapt and cope with them or they have to make other plans. So because they're not gonna go away, we need to do something about it. We need to take action. And this, I absolutely love this picture of a young girl wearing headphones because the noise of that hairdryer is simply too loud for her. She has taken action, which is really what we need to start working out how to do. So the first thing we can do is sensory integration therapy. And what sensory integration therapy is, it's a therapist provide, it's a therapy provided by an occupational therapist. 
that tries to rewire the individual's brain. And it takes place in a sensory gym with a sensory rich environment where they given opportunities for different sensory input, movement, and lots of motor challenges. And they learn to cope and adapt with these challenges. It's a client driven type of therapy. And it aims to, if I can put it, rewire the brain so that it copes better with sensory challenges. And one example I'm going to give is a child who came for sensory integration therapy, um, an eight-year-old girl, and her mom called me one day incredibly excited. We had done a bit of therapy, and I knew that her sensitivity to sound was much better. And she called me and she said, you can't believe it. She's been at school for three years now, and today is the first day she's worn long pants ever in her whole life. She's never worn long pants to school. She's never even worn a jumper to school. And today she wanted to wear a jumper and long pants because she's actually starting to feel the temperature differences that exist before all temperatures had seemed to be the same to her. And it also helped her on her toileting journey. She was having a lot of accidents and from sensory integration therapy, she improved with this. This needs to be delivered by an occupational therapist who's qualified in sensory integration um, and unfortunately, it's not done at an undergraduate level, so some postgraduate training needs to take place. Something that any occupational therapist should be able to assist you with is something called a sensory diet. Now, a sensory diet is much like a nutritional diet. It's something that you give somebody three times a day, um, just like they would have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then it helps them to stay calm and organized and to be able to attend to different things so that they can function the best they possibly can in their environment. It needs to be a personalized activity schedule with sensory based activities, and it tries to help them maintain a state of calm and reduce hyper arousal. Now, everybody's sensory diet needs to be individualized. So I'm not going to say here is a sensory diet. This should help your individual with fragile X. You'll need to consult with your occupational therapist because what might be excitatory to one person and just rev them up a little bit if they're generally low arousal might be too arousing for somebody else and it might make them seem hyperactive and then they can't attend and function optimally either. So a sensory diet, as I said, it's a schedule. It's prescriptive. It needs to happen three times a day. We need to do it every day. And I often say just because the sensory diet is working and your individual is well regulated doesn't mean you should stop it. It's helping them to stay regulated and they need it as part of their daily process. It needs to be very targeted and specific and it also needs to be age appropriate. When we're developing sensory diets, we need to think of one's chronological age as well as developmental age. And here we have an adult with fragile X who's using Lego to stay calm. Now, Lego, if you think when you press the Lego into a base plate or pieces into one another, it helps to prevent, helps to provide deep pressure. And that deep pressure is calming. So often things like Lego can be calming. And when I say we have to personalize it, if the individual is not interested in Lego, well, we're not going to include that as part of their sensory diet. It really does need to be something meaningful and something that they are going to enjoy doing. Now, there are two different types of activities we include in the sensory diet. The first one are the proactive strategies. And this is your regular three meals a day with two snacks usually, and then often bedtime prep in that sensory diet. So the three meals a day are, what are we going to do at breakfast? What are we going to do at lunch? And what are we going to do at tea time? And it might be jumping on a trampoline, animal walks, using electric toothbrushes. It may be running around the block, walking the dog. There are so many different things we need to work out for that individual, what works for them in their family context or wherever they are living. And can the support um staff in the supported accommodation help them to do those things then in mid-morning we're going to do something which is a little more sedentary usually but we call it sometimes a sensory snack 
And that might be they need hard, crunchy food. It might be that they need to go and sit in a very quiet, secluded area for a few minutes. It might be that they need to go outside, walk around the oval and get some fresh air. Then at lunchtime, there'll be another, what we call a dose of sensory input, mid-afternoon something else, dinner time something else. And then often before we go to bed, we need to do calming things so that we can help that nervous system to calm down. Before we go to bed, we generally recommend no technology for two hours before bedtime because the lights of technology are particularly stimulating and even more so for the fragile X individuals who are more sensitive to light than most people. Um, we often recommend things like having a nice warm bath, massages, using essential oils, listening to gentle calming music, dimming the lights, that type of thing, anything which is going to calm the nervous system and help one to get into a much calmer sleep-like state. So that is our proactive sensory diet. Then we're going to have a responsive sensory diet. And the responsive sensory diet is when there is a particular stimulus, something either environmental or from your internal sensory processing, which needs immediate attention. And it suddenly something flares up and we want to use some sensory input to help you calm down. So I have a young man who comes for therapy and he finds transitioning particularly challenging. But what I've found is if we use marching and he's taking the big marching steps and we sing our marching song, he's so busy focusing on those sensory inputs that he's forgotten all about his actual transition to the car and he can successfully get into the car in that way. If somebody is lethargic and they can't get out of bed and you can just see they're just lying there and you feel like you need to light a firecracker under them or something to get them motivated and up and out, turn on the music, have a dance party, do something that they're going to find fun, go outside, jump on the trampoline for a few minutes, whatever is going to work for your individual. Now, every sensory diet has different kinds of movement activities. And as I said before, it's got to be personalized and you've got to work out what is going to work for your individual. Lots of people have jumping on a trampoline as part of their sensory diet. It just helps getting them going for the day. It provides lots of movement input. So instead of them seeking it constantly throughout the day, this is part of the proactive sensory diet. We can do animal walks, swinging, um, different sports, go to the park, dancing, walking up and down a flight of stairs, going with the head in inversion, so the head lower than the rest of the body, like wheelbarrow walks, stomping, marching, taking the dog for a walk, or one of my favorites is crash and burn, which provides a lot of deep pressure input into the body. And this is where the individual rushes and they crash into a large bean bag or a crash bean bag or a crash mat or on your bed or onto the couch so that they get that sort of pressure into their whole body. As I said before, you'll need to work out with your therapist which of those activities are going to work for your individual to provide the right type of sensory input. And we also need to bear in mind that sometimes individuals are not capable of doing certain things. We don't want to include those in our sensory diet. It's going to be frustrating to them rather than them being able to use it as a good proactive strategy. The next category we have is deep pressure input or proprioception like the Lego I mentioned before. And this is where the muscles and joints are busy working to provide sensory input into the body. Using a Swiss ball as a steamroller is a great one. So this is where the individual lies on the floor and the caregiver or parent or support person takes a Swiss ball and actually uses some body weight and presses and rolls that Swiss ball over the individual. Things like wall pushes, push-ups, self hugs, praying hands, and there are lots of others. One that a lot of young children find particularly calming is playing in the sandpit. An indoor option for this is using kinetic sand or rice play. Often, deep hugs are another great source of deep pressure input. Then there are different ways that we can provide this deep pressure input throughout the day. 
Um, and this need not be administered by somebody else. So this is something that the individual can either wear or use. The one is a compression vest. Sometimes it does take a little bit um, of getting used to before the individual can wear that compression vest. There are different types of compression vests. There are the jet proof vests. There are the um, general ones. There are weighted vests, weighted backpacks, body socks. I have a young girl who every single time she comes for therapy, she actually looks for that body sock. And she just loves going in the body sock and just sitting in that body sock for a few minutes. And it just makes her to feel calm and organized. And then she'll come to the table and do different tasks with me and participate beautifully in the therapy session. But it's like she needs that deep pressure input before she actually feels calm and organized and can participate. There's also a great strategy called the therapeutic brushing um, protocol, which is a specialized sensory input, which has been taught by two OTs and um, the Wilbarkers. And your therapist can teach you how to do this. It's quite specific in the way it is administered and it needs to be done um, in a certain way to get the best outcomes. Now, maintaining regulation. This is an important thing. As I said, we want to try and give that sensory diet to provide the proactive strategies, but then occasionally we need to just throw in something else into the mix to keep your individual well regulated. The one thing there you can see is a picture of a resistance band where a young boy is pulling the band and that is providing deep pressure input into his muscles. Some people find just sitting and simply doodling helps him stay calm and regulated. Others might use a move and sit cushion, which you can see at the bottom of the screen here, or sit on a therapy ball. And then you might have fidget toys, which have become quite fashionable now. And I know there is a huge range of low cost therapy um, fidget toys at Kmart. The other way we maintain um, regulation is by providing oral input. Now, this is actually a very quick and easy way to provide sensory input. And it's often crunchy foods or very salty foods. Um, and these can just be given as snacks. And I often say to parents or caregivers, just keep a snack pack available so that when your individual needs it, you can, you can see they're becoming a bit dysregulated. You can just give them the um, food that they can eat. If they can manage, bubble gum and I like Hubba Bubba the best because you can um, tear off a big piece and they get that big um, sort of biting action happening which is a lot of deep pressure input through the jaw the other one is by sucking either through a straw or something like an icy pole deep breathing is a great way to maintain regulation and when individuals become hyper aroused we often use deep breathing these are simply cards that we just cut out around the figure and then the individual holds it. Sometimes, well, not sometimes, we know with Fragile X because they're visual learners, they respond really well to having that visual in their hand, which is just showing them what to do. And particularly when they're starting to feel a little bit dysregulated or their sensory processing is going out of whack, this visual is really important for them to try get back into a regulated state. There are just two more examples of deep breathing cards. The other system we use to calm down is the auditory system. The auditory system can be quite effective. Um, a lot of individuals with Fragile X love music. So it's just a matter of finding out what music works for them. Some music, remember, can be stimulatory. So when they're feeling a little bit down, it can sort of bring them up and other music can be really calming for them. And particularly in stressful environments or environments where there is just too much noise going on, if they have headphones, either noise cancelling headphones to block out that external noise or they're listening to music, that can be really positive for them because it's a noise that they can tolerate and something that they enjoy. In the picture at the top over here, you see something called the therapeutic listening program and the bottom shows the act that it goes with. This is one of our specialized techniques in occupational therapy where 
the child listens to certain modulated music and that too, like sensory integration, tries to change the neural pathways and how um, the brain processes that sensory information to make it more effective in its processing. Now, the sensory integration therapy, as well as the therapeutic listening therapy, are both evidence-based. They have both been highly researched and found to be very successful if applied correctly. Visual is something that we so often use our visual system and out of all our senses, we probably are the most reliant on the visual system. Now, individuals with fragile X are often hypersensitive in their visual systems and they are taking in a lot more visual information than we are. So when they're out and about, they often can become incredibly overwhelmed by visual stimuli. Now, put that together with some auditory stimuli and then put them together with some tactile stimuli of being in a very busy environment. I'm going to use a market as an example where there is lots going on. There are lots of people making lots of noise and there are people brushing past you and constantly moving in that environment. And that can all lead to sensory overload. So we just need to bear in mind what kind of environment are we exposing our individual to and then think, how can we make it calming? And sometimes you might just need to remove them from that environment a little bit and just give them something like an oil and water distractor seen at the bottom here, or just let them look up at the sky or something that is less visually overwhelming so that they can calm their sensory system down. On an olfactory level, I never wear perfume to work because, as I said with the club guy who came in with the paint, the individuals with Fragile X often find smells to be overpowering and overwhelming for them, and they then can't do what they need to do. So just be aware of too much olfactory input, but at the same time, olfactory input can actually be really calming. So something that can be calming is something that is familiar, like mum's deodorant or perfume that they're perfectly comfortable with. Lavender, we know, is one of those essential oils, which is calming. And then um, certain aromatherapy oils, things like peppermint are usually excitatory and help them to wake up if their sensory processing is too low and they're not sort of alert enough but it may be different for different individuals. And again, it's a matter of trial and error and working out what works for your individual. Some individuals are so hypersensitive to olfactory stimuli that no olfactory stimuli are going to work for them. And what we've got to bear in mind then is that we need to keep that olfactory stimuli to an absolute minimum. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about taking our individuals with sensory processing difficulties out and how we are going to help them to cope with those situations. So I often give parents permission to not go to family events, to not go to um, community events, to not go to markets and to not go out to certain things because they are so overwhelming for the individuals with fragile X. And how do we know they're overwhelming? They often don't tell us because they don't actually really recognize what is going on for them. What we know is that their behavior deteriorates and there are various different things that happen. So number one, they may start lashing out or become aggressive. Number two, they may start self-harming. So they might start biting themselves or scratching themselves. And they actually look like they are so irritated. Number three, they may try to escape. So run away, go out the door. I have a lovely young boy with Fragile X who visits me every week. And the first few times he came to OT, I actually had to lock the door of the therapy room because in this new environment, I didn't know him well. I was still testing the waters of what worked and what didn't. And little things like somebody turned on the air conditioning and that his sensory processing, I could tune out and I could habituate to that noise. But for him, it was just this constant droning in the background. 
And after about two minutes of air conditioning, he tried to run out the door. So for his safety, we had to keep that door locked because unfortunately my therapy room leads straight out onto the street. So we have to think about those things. The other thing, so we have, sorry, as I was saying, it's the fight or the flight reaction there or the freeze. Sometimes they just actually become totally immobilized and they cannot respond or they cannot do anything. So what we have to work out is when this behavior changes, is there something with their sensory processing that's going on and how can we help them with it? So a lot of these different things I've described, we can have in what we call an emergency backpack. And I recommend that all families create an emergency backpack which they can take out with them wherever they go. And in the emergency backpack, you're going to take things that will help calm your individual down. Whether it's a plush toy that they like stroking that makes them feel calm, whether it's those visual distractors, whether it's having some therapy or having headphones to block out noise, those um noise cancelling headphones, you will work out what you need in your sensory backpack to make it work so that when something goes wrong, you have it in the car, you have it with you, and you can then use those tools to help them to prevent the behaviors from escalating and so that they can actually manage the situation for whatever it is. Having difficulties with sensory processing actually affects all areas of life. So it affects learning, it affects social participation, play, and interactions of all types. When we discuss fight, flight, or flee, those three things I've mentioned as the behavioral responses to challenges with sensory processing, one of the most effective things one can do is work out what is the cause of that um, sensory overload, what is causing your individual with sensory processing difficulty to start behaving like that. If you can work out what the cause is, we have two options. Number one, we can stop the stimulus so that it no longer irritates them. Like I could turn off the air conditioning once the mum helped me to work out what the problem was. Or number two, if you can't change the stimulus, like if you're going to a noisy environment and you can't change that, then you need to actually take the individual with Fragile X and remove them from the environment. So the two things are either change the environment or move away from the environment to prevent an escalation in behaviors. And as withdrawal area is a great thing for this. Sometimes it's great just to create a withdrawal area in a room. You can have a withdrawal tent like this. It's generally um, best if it's a more enclosed area and we need to try and reduce the sensory stimuli coming into that area. So we need to try and reduce the visual stimuli. Sometimes something like a big box works well with one side open that they can retreat into the box, a table with a dark colored tablecloth on, over it so that they can go and sit under the table, a little tent like you see here. The other thing is we want to have the opportunity to um, reduce the auditory input as well. So by having a set of headphones, um, either noise cancelling headphones or headphones with a preferred type of music, we want to also try and reduce all the tactile things. So by having space in that environment, but nothing else coming into contact with them, where they're totally in control of touch, and sometimes having Comfort toys, comfort items really helps the situation. And then the other thing that we want to have is um, as little um, in position, as little demands made on the individual as possible. Because the more you're talking to them and the more you're telling them what to do, there's just, that's just another sensory stimulus you're adding to the mix and it just all becomes too challenging. So we just want to try and reduce everything so that they can calm down their nervous system and get back to where they need to be. So there are lots of different places you can get all these um, sensory objects and things that I've been talking about. I will provide Wendy and Liz with the list after the presentation which they can then use and um, put out to the families. And then you can get 
um, those different tools or gadgets or whatever works. Unfortunately, most of them, it's not a try before you buy situation. But if your occupational therapist has access to various different items, that is often very helpful. And you can see, because as I said before, it's not one recipe fits all. You have to work out what works for your individual. Um, I've just thought of something that I missed out before. Just There's just two types of sensory processing challenges which mainly affect the fragile X population. And the one type of challenge is, as I've mentioned many times, that hypersensitivity to various different um, stimuli. And the second type of challenge is a discriminative challenge. So they find it difficult to work out differences in types of touch. So they can't differentiate between light touch and um, hard, uh, painful sort of touch. And they can't work out differences between small movements and large movements. And that sensory processing challenge often makes it difficult for them to become well coordinated and to interact appropriately with things. So we often have the fragile X individual who loves their younger sibling and kind of wants to squash them to death because they cannot discriminate and work out how hard they're pushing and how much pressure they're applying to their pet, their baby brother, or that type of thing. And while they mean to be affectionate, they just can't control how much force they're applying because their sensory system isn't helping them to interpret that type of information effectively. I feel like I've done a lot of talking and I'm sure there are quite a few questions. So I'm going to say thank you all for attending. Thank you all for listening and being here because a sensory processing challenge is something that every individual with fragile ex experiences differing degrees, different types of sensory processing challenges, but everyone experiences them. But on the flip side, not everybody experiencing sensory processing challenges has fragile X. They are very prevalent on the autism spectrum. They are also um, present in neurotypical children and neurotypical adults, as well as many different neurodiverse um, diagnoses. So Lots of people are experiencing different sensory processing challenges. And then just to also bear in mind that not everything is a challenge. It only becomes a challenge when it affects one's behavior. We all have sensory preferences. So some people prefer sound to listening to certain things quietly. Others may tolerate sound more. Others may tolerate certain types of clothing, some don't, some like eating certain types of food, others don't. So everybody has sensory preferences and it only becomes a challenge or a difficulty when it's affecting behavior and impacting on the way you live your life.